So, yeah, my name's Liz, I'm from Psychology, and I just thought I could talk to you a little bit today about photolicitation, which is a method that I have been using a bit in my research, both within my sort of domestic violence research and the pedagogic student stuff that I've been doing. Um, and I really just kind of want to introduce you to the method in case you weren't familiar with it um, and sell you basically all the benefits and all the reasons that I currently love it. Um, I'm going to discuss a little bit about how it was useful in working with students and how it's given me and my colleagues certainly um, an insight into the student experience that I think we hadn't captured before. Um, and I'm going to just kind of illustrate with two studies, one that was looking at final year undergraduate students on um, in terms of student satisfaction and one that was looking at a postgraduate experience as well. Um, and those are the ones which I prefer if you didn't copy or anything because they've got their participant photos on. Um, so, what is photo elicitation? I mean, in a very simple form, photo elicitation is basically about using a photo or a visual stimulant of some kind in an interview setting. So, within the qualitative area, in terms of obviously the um, different methods that are used, obviously interviews is one of the really popular methods. Semi-structured interviews in particular are probably one of the most common that are used within the area. Um, and that would say that's in psychology and probably beyond into education and beyond that as well. So photo elicitation is basically about using pictures or um, photos or any sort of visual sort of aspect within the interview. And it was created sort of, I think, within the sort of anthropological research is where it sort of started. Um, and it's certainly not been used within psychology a huge amount up until recently. Um, but it's thought that actually when you are doing an interview, a picture can really alter the tone of the interview. So when you are talking about it in terms of um, perhaps a sensitive or an emotional subject, the pictures and the emotional connections that people have with the memories that are prompted by that picture are thought to give like a richer and deeper um, understanding of that experience. So it's used quite with that sort of experiential side. It's also really good because when I kind of talk through just in a second the reasons that I, um, I think it's really positive, it can give you new perspectives and new understandings of topics that you might have understood previously from obviously the different research that exists. So it kind of gives you that um, opportunity to develop that sort of new perspective and I'll give you an example that's quite good of that. Um, so the reasons that I like it then, it's a bit of a whistle-stop tour obviously and I'm happy to answer any questions after so I apologise if I'm flying through this. Um, but in terms of the advantages of it, I really like it as a method because of the flexibility of it for a start. It's something like with an interview, it can be used across different um, subject areas, it can be used across different d disciplines. Um, it can be used with different populations. So I think that when we start talking about using photos within an interview setting, some people will assume that there'll be some subjects that are um, off topic, I suppose, or, or ethically unsuitable for it. But I think that we have found within the research that I've done with my various colleagues that actually it's, it's been, there's very few that I think it would be really inappropriate for. There are obviously some that would come with quite a lot of cautions and, and guidance about that. But like, for example, I've used it with the work with my students, but I've also used it with um, my other area of research is working with male victims of domestic violence. And I've used it really um, positively, actually, there in terms of exploring uh, what we described at the time as their recovery from um, their experience. It's something that actually through the process of doing this, we've really moved away from this recovery idea as the language that we're using, because through that story, none of them have actually recovered in that sense from their experience. So it's quite good and you can use it within different populations and as I say it's been used across different disciplines, less so in psychology but it has been used within sociology, anthropology and some of the wider areas like that in, in some of the health research as well. So it is flexible um, and as I say it can be a method on its own, it could be just a different style of qualitative interview that you might be using within your research but you can also combine it with other techniques. It can be used within an interview setting but it could also be used in a focus group as well so you could have it within that kind of group um, setting. Um, it's been used within things like evaluations as well so it can be used as a tool very flexibly based on what it is that you're hoping to achieve with it. And it fits very well with different types of qualitative analysis. So where I have used it, I've always used the um, interview still or the, the text, that, or the text, the narrative that the participant gives you around the photo. That's always been the data that I've used. But you can use it and um, analyse that data sort of thematically, IPA, content analysis, discourse analysis. You can also kind of use the photos in that data sense, but that isn't something that I've actually done, so I can't really comment a huge amount on that. 
Um, one of the other things that I think for me in particular um, is really important is the participatory nature of it. So for me, um, you are giving the whole control of the interview to the participant. So I should say actually there are two kind of types and two ways you can do this. So I've always used it in a participant driven or a participatory way, which is where the participants bring their own photos to talk through. But you could also use it where you were to bring the photos as a researcher, so a researcher driven one. You could bring, say, for example, photos that you wanted to discuss if there were particular aspects and you wanted kind of that emotional connection that people might have to different um, visual images. But the participa participatory nature of it, I think, means that you can give that control to your participant and they will, they will bring basically the interview schedule or the questions by bringing those photos to you. And it's been used really inclusively within the, the wider research, as I say, not so much in psychology, but beyond that, where you can give the opportunity for some groups who have perhaps not always had um, a huge stake in the research because they've not always been involved with it, but you can give them the opportunity to become engaged and, and have a, a, a voice in that as well in that sense so for example people who have learning disabilities or people that would find the nature of a one-to-one -one interview where you're sort of looking into somebody's you know eyes as you're interviewing and answering questions having that photo can really kind of change the atmosphere of the interview and make it easier for some people to talk and one of the things that i think where i mentioned before about the new understandings you can develop this idea of breaking the frame was talked about in a paper that um, I read quite early on in, in learning about this and in using photos with um, children who I think I think it was children who had been diagnosed with cancer um, and they were talking about their experience of the treatment and things like that and the photos that they brought had really challenged um, the researcher in terms of how he understood what he thought he knew about it as an issue because this one child had brought a photo that was he, he didn't know what the photo was but it was basically a climbing frame but taken from the perspective of somebody much shorter than he is obviously and it kind of gave a real insight into the conversations and the barriers that that child was facing at the time so it's those kind of new um, experiential insights into the um, data that I think are really important and it's one of the reasons I really like it um, Sally please do flag obviously if I'm talking too long <laughs> I'll just get it a little bit more today um, so the other things I think as well is kind of linking back to the participatory nature of it is that it's not really reliant on your knowledge or experience in creating those questions for your interview. So for my work with uh, male victims of domestic violence, I am not a man and I have luckily never experienced that type of violence. So my questions would always be informed by my experience in the research and in the area, whereas they bring their own experience and really challenge some of the things that I thought I knew or some of the things that I thought would be important. And so that was a really powerful thing for me and it can be that across obviously whatever area you're looking at. So it really does genuinely give people that opportunity to have the control of the discussion, to have their own agenda being the thing that is dominating, not you as a researcher. Obviously you will have um, a research aim and a research question and how you guide what photos they might take will help structure that and ensure that you can kind of still, you know, obviously answer your research question. But it's really just, as I say, giving that opportunity for experts by experience to really be able to talk and, and bring that experience, I suppose, to life almost in, in the interview. There are obviously cautions that come alongside it, so there may be some um, subject matter that might not be appropriate. Um, I can't think of one off the top of my head now as I'm trying, obviously, but I mean, when I said I was going to do one with domestic violence, a lot of people assumed that it would be, oh, we can't do that. But it's like actually when people are bringing photos of what was impactful to them, they don't bring photos of um, injuries or abuse, they bring photos of other things that were important at the time, certainly within the one that I was doing because of the nature of the, um, the, the excuse me, it was post-separation, um, but you can give guidance in terms of things that people shouldn't bring, for example, so don't bring photos of people who haven't given their consent to have that photo as part of it, of children, of anybody identifiable in that way. Um, how you guide what photos they bring, I think, can really mitigate some of the risks that comes with that, um, but there are obviously ethical considerations around the fact you're prompting um, memories that can be really powerful and emotional and sensitive, but I think because they are bringing that themselves themselves then they're in control of that and if they didn't want to then discuss that say in the interview they'd be welcome not to you know just to take that photo out for example so relevant I suppose more so to, to the discussion obviously of these seminars is um, I've used it with some of the students um, that I've worked with and the first study that I did um, was looking at third year and final students, psychology students, experiences of um, student satisfaction really for want of a better word. It came out of some work that um, I've done with a colleague at Edge Hill where we were really kind of just, um, 
I suppose the the NSS and all the issues that come with that, that I can't see any of your faces right now, but I'm sure that you understand, um, in terms of actually the way that it captures student experience. And what we wanted to do was kind of really capture that actually the, there's this qualitative work that's obviously looked at the student experience, but they have largely been guided by some of the NSS areas or some of the areas that we traditionally know impact on students. So for us, it was really the opportunity to say, please just bring photos that capture your experience of being, of being a student in psychology at either the University of Cumbria or Edge Hill because I worked with um, Linda Kerr down there. So one of the examples here, I've got some photos here, <laughs> you can see the lovely older um, decorating of Skidar there and that corridor on the first, um, as you go in on the ground floor there. But one of the things that I think came out, we did see some of the things obviously that we would see within the NSS. So they did talk about things like um, assessment and feedback and the importance of pastoral support. But I think some of these photos here had really generated a discussion about the importance for our students, particularly I think because of the nature of our university being a bit smaller, about how actually they had um, the importance of that tutor and staff relationship that they had. The fact that we, for this photo here, um, the student talked about the fact that most of the psychology team were based on this corridor and that she knew when she came down there that she could find somebody either if she just needed a bit of support or if she needed help. Similarly down there we have like a little psych lab which is a dedicated space for our students and that bottom left picture kind of captured that discussion which was really actually about the learning environment and the fact that they talked quite a lot about working collaboratively as students and again being on that corridor where we were and feeling part of a psychology learning environment and this was done before that learning environment element was really added into the NSS, so I think it's really interesting that that's kind of come out of that now. It's not come out of my study, obviously, but that it's been added in. Um, and the top right one was, again, a student that was talking about the fact that they felt part um, of a wider university community and how important that was to them to feel part of the university and to feel part of something bigger. So that was a really important thing that we'd kind of seen um, come out of that. So that's just an example of how I've used it with the student satisfaction at undergraduate. And then just briefly, um, our postgraduate student experience is again something that's been neglected quite a lot within the literature, certainly in psychology and the sort of social sciences where um, I'm based anyway. But the postgraduate experience again has been captured where we do look at the metrics on that. It's captured within that sort of quite quantitative PTES, PRES kind of um, surveys and things. So it was again about trying to understand actually what is important. Postgraduate obviously comes with the different demands around time, around balance, around different roles that people often people often have. So it was really again looking at actually well what is important to postgraduate students in that context. And they talked again actually quite a lot about the learning community which was really positive and how they felt part of that. For some, they didn't feel part of that because they were, this was a mix of uh, masters and PhD students and some of the PhD students that were working quite remotely at the time had not really felt part of it the same and really wanted to. And they talked quite a lot about balance, which is that top left picture and about actually trying to juggle the different roles that they had. So being, say, for example, a student and then an employee of whatever organisation they work in and then a mom and a partner and things like that. And that actually at postgrad, they found that a lot more challenging and then interestingly having an outlet so this picture here again with the bike and the um, lovely hillside that was representing actually that for the that person in particular and it was seen across a few different participants that that importance of having something that was not work and not, not academia and research and stuff that they would then separate themselves into was again really important for how they then managed their well-being and talking about things like when they weren't able to do that 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 had really impacted on how they felt about their studies as well so again, this just kind of gave us a little bit of an insight really into the postgrad experience and, and again, some things which might have not been picked up on um, just as much. So again, I think this, this method has really lent itself well to both of these to give us an idea of actually things that are perhaps not always seen in the literature, but also just get that experiential aspect as well within them bringing their questions to us and those, that those students and those participants bring in their photos. Um, so that's just me very briefly. Um, shameless, well, no, it's not a shameless plug of my paper. What I was just going to point out is that um, with Julie and Joe, who work in psychology here on Linda at Edge Hill, um, we wrote a paper basically um, about a little bit about how to use it in psychology because it's something that hadn't been used. Um, and obviously, within the nature of the sort of stuff that we do in our team anyway, it was it's a really important method and can be really um, helpful in that way. Um, so I hope that's been um, interesting and I'm happy to answer any questions and I'm sorry if that was a bit of a whistle-stop sort of fast-paced tour through that. 
No, that was that was great. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Liz. That's that's been really, really helpful. Um, I'd like to open it up now. If everybody's if anybody's got a, a question, either just speak now uh, or just uh, write your question and um, then Liz will field the answers and share the answers. Um, while people are having a moment to think about that, can I just ask you a question, Liz? That was really interesting. And um, one of the things that I'm quite interested in is the ethical issues. And I know you touched on that uh, in your talk. But have you found that, obviously, you're based at the University of Cumbria, but the colleague that you were working with was based in Edge Hill. Um, to what extent have you found um, that it's easy or challenging to get your projects through ethical approval process? You know, what were the ethics panel's reactions to your work? Um, mine, genuinely, genuinely, generally, sorry, were quite positive. So I felt that actually the colleagues at University of Cumbria, in particular because that was the only one that I went to with the domestic violence uh, related one as well, which was probably the trickiest one. Um, they're mostly supportive, really. I would say that the similar sort of ethical questions come up that I then try every time, then I do it, obviously try within the next one to address it, to anticipate it. Um, but things like how you would mitigate um, thing, oh, that's what it's an example, like if they brought a photo that was inappropriate or if they said something that might be a safeguarding issue. But the reality is that that is a risk when you're doing any sort of qualitative work because they could always um, risk asking a question or, or, or giving you an answer that makes you, you know, concern and raise that. Um, the emotive aspect of it and that sort of sensitivity, I think, again, was something, so the idea that actually you're tapping into something that could be very distressing and you're saying that photos will prompt those emotional connections. But again, I suppose my response to that has been that actually when you give that um, control of that to your participant, then they're not going to bring anything that they don't want to talk about. Or it's certainly, and obviously within the risks on the information sheet and everything, it is always about obviously just only talk about things that you feel that you can, that you feel sort of... Um, able to talk about that aren't too distressing for you and everything. Um, so I think I kind of have tried to mitigate it a little bit with that. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Thank you. I can see a couple of questions popping up. So you choose, you can go in the order that they've been presented if you would like. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, Pete, I think it might be from Yorkshire, but that student wasn't um, based in Cumbria, so that might be where um, that picture has come from. Um, Ian has said, in the present environment, do you think this is something that could be used online, um, uploading images to a wider audience to gain comment? That's a really interesting question, actually. Um, I think there is, yeah, I think that there is a possibility for doing that. I would say the ethical issues when you're sharing in that way um, is probably a bit different. So, for example, where I've used photos as part of the dissemination, I always seek that additional consent to do that. So, on the consent form that I was put in with the ethics and that they obviously then sign, it's about consent, obviously, to take part, um, but it's also about do you consent to use your photos in the interview? Do you consent to me using non-identifiable photos in my dissemination, so in conferences and stuff? And it's a really powerful way to kind of talk about um, experience when you're at a conference. And people are free to, to say no if they don't want to do that aspect of it. Um, I think there may be probably different challenges, if depending on the subject, I guess, if you're then kind of uploading them to a wider audience. But I think if people are informed of that and, and are giving consent appropriately, then I think that that would be fine. Um, I'm not sure if that, I hope that answers your question, Ian. Yeah, yeah, uh, Heather, quite a powerful approach with international students who don't have English as a first language. Yeah, I absolutely agree, actually, because it's been used as um, it's been used with so many different groups. If you just sort of, you know, do a quick Google Scholar of it, as I say, a lot of it's not psychology, but there's a lot of stuff that has looked at um, experience of um, recovery from illness, of um, homelessness, of poverty, so there's lots of different really sensitive aspects that have been and issues that have been used uh, that this method has been used with, um, and I think that yeah, tapping into any group where any sort of communication issue, so for example, if English isn't a first language but your first language is English, then it could be a really powerful way to kind of have that discussion. I think that's a really a really good idea actually, Heather. Um, 
So have, have your students used this approach in their small scale research? Um, yes, so some of the students have used it within their um, qualitative research um, projects within sort of second year and um, not so much first year, but second year and third year. Some of our students have used it for their dissertations. Um, yeah, and they've, they've done really well with it as well, actually. I think it's, um, they see the advantages. And it's, again, it's topic dependent as to how appropriate it is. But most of the students that I've worked with, to the best of my knowledge, have done this sort of um, participant driven one. So they haven't done the research driven one. So I think they've sort of really benefited from that. Well, my uh, students are um, education students, so they're training as teachers. So I could see that would be a really useful approach with children. Yeah, oh yeah, definitely, absolutely. The ethical issues that arise, arise with children, um, there was there's quite interesting discussion about the ethical issues with it. Um, when you're working with children, I think you obviously risk the issues around the photos that they're going to bring um, and the consent and how usable they yeah, could be. I see that. But actually, I think it's a really good it's a really good way for children to bring the sort of experience you might not know to ask about and stuff. So yeah, definitely. Thanks, Lou. It's okay. Um, Daniela's asked Daniela, about. Just, just, does, does Daniela want to ask her own question? Just, just to sort of give you a bit of a break, Liz. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot that you said I should do that. No, it's absolutely fine. Yeah, uh, thank you for asking that. And um, I really, um, that sounds very interesting to me. And I wanted to, to ask you, how do you, you know, analyze your data? So, um, let me see if I, um, do you usually um, record uh, this, the, the talk, the discussion, and then you analyze the data after? Can, can you make me um, see, make me understand better how you do you analyze the data if there is any coding strategy that you prefer? So just to look at the practical side. Yeah. Of course, Thank yeah. And that's a really good question, actually. I, did, I, don't, I didn't kind of touch on that. Um, the way it, I would, the photos come to the interview almost in place of an interview schedule and everything else that happens after that I do as I would with any sort of semi-structured interview. So the photos become the questions, so I'd still transcribe the interview and I still analyse it. I, I typically use thematic analysis in my work, um, but then I would analyse the transcripts as I would do it with any sort of other semi-structured interview. Um, I don't use the photos as the data, I use it kind of as I say, instead of an interview schedule. So it could be that um, if you were wanting to analyse the photos as part of it, you would probably need to approach it a little bit differently, but that's not something I've actually got experience with. Um, so yeah, whatever your um, coding strategy or your analytical strategy that fits with kind of your own, obviously ontological and epistemological positions and things like that, whatever you think best fits for the data, if it was just an interview, just an interview, um, I would use the same. It's just your photos give you perhaps a, a richer um, insight into their experience. I see. So you use that just to elicit more information, which could be especially for emotion, I would say. So something to understand them. But that's great. Thank you very much for your answer. That's OK. It, it is for things like emotional um, aspects. It's really good for things like that. But it is anything just where you want to kind of find out um, where you, you really want to explore their experience and give them that control and look to see if there are any sort of unexplored aspects, if you think that there might be. So I suppose you can be, because I always been interested, but because of time constraint, I never use that. So I really look looking to using that as a researcher. So and um, you um, just so you can use either way by proposing your pictures or even asking them to bring something which for them is particularly uh, like interesting or kind of ex expressing their feelings, which would of course enrich your uh, research and that. So you can use either way. Is that correct? Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I've only ever used photo elicitation. Um, but I've just kind of noticed Pete's comment there about um, objects and images as well, because this uh, this sort of approach, I suppose, could be really flexible. Um, one of our undergraduate dissertation students has just done a music elicitation one, which was to do with exploring the power of music. And um, I can't remember what specific element it was related to because he's not my student, but um, he had stu um, participants bring uh, bits of music that were powerful to them and to talk about why and how that had kind of impacted on them. Other people have used object elicitation so where you bring something, you know, for example, that is um, important and um, that you want to discuss because it, it could be that people don't have the capacity to take photos. So it could be, say, for example, Sue mentioned about children. It could be that they bring something, almost like a little show and tell type thing, 
where they bring something that they want to talk about that represents whatever it is that you know you're trying to understand so it could be you know something that represents their friendships or their experience at school or something and if you don't kind of want to give the whole photo elicitation element of it if you think that the cameras might be inappropriate or that people won't have mobile phones obviously now most people take photos on their phones and then we'll sort of email them through obviously to be part of the discussion but back when this was first created pre-camera phone um it was about giving dig uh, digital photos no it wasn't uh, disposable cameras sorry um and obviously then there would be the cost ensued with processing them and things and obviously not necessarily so knowing what the pictures are going to be at the other side of it. But there are lots of different ways, I think, around it. And I suppose for me, as I keep sort of banging on about, it's about really just giving the control of what they're talking about to that participant and allowing them to bring that with them, really regardless of what it could be. You know, with children, it could work if, it, if you're doing some sort of creative drawing or art-based work or something. It's just them bringing what they want to talk about. That's great. Thank you very much for your answer. Uh, thank you for the book recommendation, Pete. I'll have a look at that. I think um, did I miss you. anybody's questions? No, I think Pete had another question, and then Neil. If Pete and then Neil would like to address their questions to Liz. Oh, sorry, I haven't seen, I haven't seen the ones down there. Yeah, hi, guys. Uh, thanks, Liz. That was great. Um, you know, I, I, I've come across, I've, I think I've read the paper and things like that. So um, I do think it's really helpful to have an alternative way of generating data with students you know that isn't um a little survey you know <laughs> uh, so that's great i mean um, but I, I really am uh, recently looking at this idea of new materialism some of the reading is pretty mind-blowing you know it's quite a uh, sort of philosophical and difficult to get hold of but some people are trying to use it for classroom research so what they're saying is that the object uh, an object like say a textbook or say we're using some science equipment like a pendulum that the the object actually has agency and voice whereas in the past there's been too much emphasis on just the dialogue you know just the speaking of the teacher and the children so i just think um yeah that it's really interesting i wonder whether your photos in a way they obviously are intended to have voice aren't they and and agency in the in the generation of data and i Wondered whether you had some that were kind of like you could give us an example of something that say was quite uh, surprising or was you felt enabled that person to talk about something that, you know, was particularly difficult. I mean, you don't have to be specific, but maybe it was from your other um, your violence research where, you know, that I can see that an object like a something could be very have a lot of meaning behind it. Yeah. Um... I think, I suppose there's two examples I can think of there. One was um, he, a uh, man, because it was obviously men that I work with, in, uh, is my domestic violence stuff. Um, one of them was where he had brought a photo that represented, it wasn't his family, pictures of his family, but it represented the fact that when um, the abusive relationship had ended and they'd split up, that the impact of what he'd experienced was exacerbated by the fact that he'd lost his extended family. Because obviously when you're a partner, if you're a close family, you've got your sort of set of family and in-laws and the in-laws and everything like that and the, how that works and I think that I'd never really kind of and obviously a lot of people assume that once you've escaped from that relationship that that's the you know you'd be better because the abuse has ended but I think for him he kind of talked about actually how much he missed his extended family but felt no longer able to connect with them because of what had happened to him and I think that that had given me a real insight that I think I hadn't really anticipated um in terms of that because when we were talking like if you're talking about um, people that are fathers, for example, and the children, and how that then can mean that grandparents don't see the children, for example, I had anticipated that, but not so much actually for him and how he felt that he had lost so much of his social support and circle. Um, so that was one. Um, the other one is um, he was trying to really describe, he was trying to describe really just how he felt. And um, the photo that he brought is a statue that I, I've, I've used sort of in some of the um, pictures that I've used, uh, conferences I've done before. Because it's a statue, I think it's somewhere in Europe, um, and it's a statue that was created to represent grief, the person that made it. Um, and it's basically just a man sat on a bench, but like a completely hollowed out, you know, where your stomach and that would be. And he said that he'd seen that photo when he was away and when he'd seen it kind of in, it's in the, the actual, um, the actual statue and taken a photo of it because he said he'd never seen anything that represented quite how empty and lonely he felt and how everything that had happened to him had just ripped away 
not just, like because obviously you leave and and that's better you you better to be away from the violence and the abuse but the actual what's left over was an emptiness and a loneliness that i don't think i would have felt the impact of if he hadn't had that photo that was just so it was so powerful um as part of that discussion so i don't does that kind of answer your question a little bit because yeah I, I know what you mean about actually them having agency within the, the data creation i suppose yeah i suppose the two levels of agency the, the he chose the photo and so the photo then then you then he brought it to the discussion and then it's really powerful even beyond like you said beyond what he said it had an impact on you so that that's i think what the um karen barrard would argue is the agency of the image that's great thank you very much thank you hello liz it's neil i've um read um two of your articles about photo elicitation and they were really interesting i'm myself i'm doing um work using uh, photo elicitation as a method with um, conservation organisations in the Lake District National Park and their stakeholders such as um, hill farmers for example. Um, I've just written a uh, draft um, article on the work with the National Trust. And one of the things that came back to me was that um, I should be using statistics and there's nine people involved personally I think that's just far too low a number of people to be doing a detailed statistical analysis with uh, um, any thoughts I mean you've um, used it and got things published and um, I mean what what is the rationale for you using statistics no real explanation just to make it more understandable if uh, you add up all the results try and make them into um, uh, uh numerical form if you like um no i don't i don't think that that's necessarily appropriate if it doesn't fit for your research question i mean statistically if we're talking i mean because i teach statistics as well so I, I do value very much both types of data that you can get but i think that it goes against the ethos and the, the motivation of doing qualitative i think to try and quantify it in that way and um, you would also have no statistical power with only nine participants because you've collected so much rich data that that's why you've got a small sample size because they give you so much more than you know collecting lots of numbers from you know like a wide range of people um so i know I, I would disagree um with that i suppose i mean pippa's just commented about content analysis actually that would be the only way you could do any sort of quantitative work that i think personally would be meaningful although i'm saying that based obviously I'm not you've given me a rough idea of what you're doing i don't know a huge amount about the area but that would be kind of my gut um reaction to that i think mm. okay uh, yeah it's, it's in line with what i thought to be quite honest yeah and the content, content analysis is a really valuable way to do that and it could be a way to give um, meaningful numbers that might satisfy their want of numbers without you kind of doing something that doesn't have any power because you could kind of talk about it's kind of looking actually very much about the language that they use and whether there are specific words that come up for example and if you think that that would be appropriate then I think that that could be one way but I would only recommend doing it if you think it fits yeah thank you that's really helpful great thanks does Pippa want to come in and then Pete? <laughs> it was only actually just I when Andrew was um, talking about the quantifying uh, data where I've used uh, photos or images with some content analysis, I could see that there might be space for that approach or someone might I wouldn't suggest it or it wouldn't be my preference but I can understand that some researchers might the number lovers um as perhaps we might Pete might be calling them there um might be attracted towards trying to qu quantify the content of the images that you're producing um personally I think the qualitative side is powerful in yeah. its own right I think it's inappropriate for such a small number of people. We're talking about nine um, participants from the National Trust, and um, well, 
I think as well, Neil, probably just to kind of re just to come back off what Pippa said because I hadn't really I hadn't even thought about doing the content analysis on the photos, but I, I wouldn't feel like that would be appropriate um, based on what you've asked them to do and why you've asked them to bring them. The content analysis, yeah. if you were to do it, to me would have to be on the sort of the data and the the transcripts and stuff that you've got from what they've said. Um, yeah. I certainly wouldn't recommend. I feel like as well you would need to kind of tell the participants that you were going to analyse their images before they consented to take part as well because that might change whether they wanted to potentially because it's such a personal thing the thought of somebody analyzing such a personal kind of image that's you know important to you they might then actually prefer not to take part so i'd say that that would also raise some ethical issues to be fair yeah okay that's very well, useful point. i feel that what you said liz about your approach was okay that you're basically you're using thematic analysis so um is it Andrew? Andrew, I, I think it's very, I mean, if you have a look at some um, Braun and Clark 2019, where they, they kind of review um, thematic analysis and they identify three uh, approaches. And one of them is at the positive end. And it, it you know, includes things like um, framework analysis, Richie and Lewis's, where they basically count. They're not counting the people, though. That's where I don't think your sample size matters. It's the amount of data you generated. You're, you're counting within the data. So you're not you're not saying oh one of them said um, you know you're not necessarily using the sample number of the number of participants as as a sample it's the data you've generated so within that data generated from nine say photo elicitation interviews there's a mass of data and it can be for some people depending on your philosophical position uh, it counting can be acceptable if you read that Braun and Clark 2019 they have the three types of thematic analysis going from a positivist a middle ground one which they call i think code book and then the right hand one which is what they try to stick to which is a very um relativist uh, more qualitative true to the tradition of qualitative analysis so which they call reflexive analysis uh, thematic analysis so that's really important i think have some reading on that and then decide what analysis you're using and then how counting might fit in a pragmatic way Thank you. It was Neil. Neil, the name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Thank you. Um, I think Heather had a question. Hi. It's just. Um... It's just a, um, an observation, really. I agree with what's been said, but um, some people differentiate between metonymic and metaphoric. So in, in terms of what's actually on the photograph, so that would be more content analysis, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, the background towards the meaning of that photograph is, is something different or something as well as. So there are two positions there. But yeah, if you're getting into reflection, reflexivity, diffractive methodologies, then you're um, you know, you're into a different sort of philosophical position. So I think I think that's really important. And I, you know, um, I know Neil's work probably better than some of the people here because I'm one of the supervisors. But I think Neil, that you, you know, that justification of why people want numbers or don't want numbers is is perhaps really important. Thanks. That's really helpful, Heather. Thank you. It's an interesting point actually that you've raised there, Heather, about what the photos represent because it's just it's just prompted that actually. Um, some of the photos that people were bringing within, I suppose, within all the different um, projects that I've done, some of them do represent what the what you would anticipate it represents just by looking at it as an outsider. But for other people, it was very much what it represented. And I think that for whenever people would talk, wanted to bring a photo about a person or a relationship, because we kind of encouraged them not to bring photos where they'd not got obviously, because you have to get consent for the for the person in the photo. Um, a lot of people found ways around that and took photos of things that represented that person so i think that in that student example that skidor corridor represented the staff team to that student because you know that's where we were all were um, but she couldn't bring photos of us but that was important so she sort of looked for that representation so i, I really like actually the word put there um as a point to raise any other questions I asked nervously because they were they were fairly easy to answer, I think. So 
Um, Liz, I, I had a, a question. You talked a bit earlier about um, the work that you were doing with students. Um, and to what extent did they um, use the, the sort of like metaphoric, to use um, the, the term that Heather's introduced um, and you, uh, were they using metaphoric images to actually not just only talk about their own learning journey, but also to actually help them? In, in what ways can photo elicitation help a participant in their own life? You know, so in terms of, say, the stress bucket, I mean, people find that stress bucket itself, for people who don't know what I'm talking about, that, you know, the, the NHS has this idea of, of you having a stress bucket. And obviously, with, with COVID-19 pandemic, there's been an awful lot more liquid coming into your stress bucket. And for some people, their stress bucket is overflowing um, if you haven't got enough uh, holes in it to let that stress come out and also people have different sizes of stress bucket but you know if the students are using say that image of, of a stress bucket does that actually help them as well I mean can they learn and improve their lives through photo elicitation more so than if you were just having an ordinary not that it's ordinary but you know questionnaire or face-to-face -face interview or something like that does it does it have more scope in other words to be helpful um that's a really good question that i don't feel i can probably answer um and i don't know the answer to that but that's a really that's a really interesting point um i think that the the photos and the, the gathering of photos has certainly been something that participants have commented on to me um in both types of the work that i've done um i think for the for the men that i've worked with um i would say that the, there's a cathartic element of telling the story especially when it's a group of um because men, men's experiences have traditionally not been looked at or, or explored as much because i think that's somebody just asking you to tell your story it can be really powerful for someone who wants to be heard i don't know to the extent at which actually that would be different because the photos are there compared to me sort of just interviewing them other than i guess they're bringing a lot more of their own um personal aspect but the students in particular actually said that they found it quite, they'd enjoyed collecting the photos to kind of bring, because it makes you sit and think about it. Um, so I don't know fully around actually how it kind of helps them, but I certainly think it's, I get more positive response than doing interviews. You know, they, they talk about actually, like, I, it was quite nice to actually sit and think about what, what different bits are important to me. So yeah, actually it could be, it's quite possible that that's um, the case. It'd be something to, to look into with that. Um, I've just seen Pete's got a question. What part did participants have in the data analysis? Oh, was it only participatory? Um, for, for the work that I've done so far, it's only been participatory in the sense of the data generation. So they were um, very participatory in the interview and how we talk, what we talked about. Um, I haven't personally done it in a more participatory way in terms of them um, helping with the data analysis, but I know that there's others that have, and I think that you could certainly facilitate that um, in that way, but it's not something that I've got experience of at this point, I'm afraid. I'm just reading Pete's other question. Um, so Pete said it's useful for interviews to be based on an artifact because it may make the discussion more grounded, such as a teacher bringing a lesson plan or a video, but in a way do the photo make it potentially less grounded because they're often concrete but representing an abstract idea. Um, Again, I'm not sure how to answer that, but I think that's a really good point and not something that I've actually considered, but it's certainly something I would think about, certainly based on my, my own recognition, I suppose, in just thinking about what sort of photos they do bring. Um, I think that that would be something definitely to explore in a bit more detail. I haven't missed any questions, have I, now? Um, I think Heather had a point to make, and also Rebecca might have had a point. I'm not sure whether she wants wants to ask as well. I did think I saw Rebecca typing. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Liz. Um, I, I, I think um, I did some work on um, our, our students and um, a group of um, students we were working with overseas on bringing a photograph um, that they took that they would post on social media, one photograph, 
um, as a reflection on their outdoor experience, so an expedition, a journey, or a, a day in the mountains, or, or whatever it was. I did it in, in several different um, places with several different sets of students. And I think that that really got, that's what I mean by saying that the question you're asking perhaps supports them in their thinking, because they they were thinking about, well, what, what would I post? What, what would be the thing? And then I was asking them, do you edit it in any way? Do you post it publicly or, pri you know, whatever? And um, they were, it, it was quite interesting because um, the research that had come through before was saying perhaps that there was a difference between males and female students in what they would post on social media. But my research with a bigger sample actually showed that it was age that seemed to have uh, a difference in what they were what they were posting because the older students were thinking seemed to be thinking much more deeply about why they had the more of the metaphoric reasons for posting it rather than just this is a nice photograph and that was really interesting um, talking with those students and actually also I actually used a little capture with a little questionnaire thing that they could write to partly be, mainly because um, I was working with Spanish students and my Spanish isn't good enough to capture all their thinking so they could talk to me in, in English and Spanish and then write a bit so that I could I could sort of gather the whole of the you know what you would have as an interview really which was quite was quite useful. That's really interesting actually I hadn't considered um, I'm just trying to think now I suppose within my student sample where there was a bit more a, a little more diversity in the age of the participants um, I'm not sure whether they did um, there were differences actually in the photos but again I think that'd be something really interesting to look at um, and I think this conversation has been really interesting because it's generated a lot of things for me to think about really around um, my approach and, and my approach I suppose and the, the questions that I um, haven't answered yet, but would quite like to explore, I suppose. Um. Yeah, Pete, the, about the photo, taking the pressure off the participant. Um, I think it's just even just very practically having something there between you, between you and another person to talk about, I think can be really, um, it can just ease somebody in, especially if you're not used to taking part in very formal interviews like that, just for not to have to look at the person you're talking to and to just kind of look at and point at the photo, I do think has taken the pressure off, um, certainly for some students that perhaps are a bit more socially anxious as well, for, for the work that I've done anyway, and I imagine beyond into the other areas too. It kind of provides a third space, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, the homey baba idea. Yeah. Um, oh, Pete. Does Pete want to ask that question? Yeah, yeah Liz, I, I was interested in, you know, I do like the idea of actually, um, because I know that, say, in Pippa's work, where the kids draw, draw it, they draw some things, you know, and it's great to have those images as part of the data, just just for marketing, really, and impact. And everybody likes a little kid's drawing of, of their brain or something like that, you know, so, so they were trying to express their ideas and that. So that I do think... That's the data you're talking about, Pete. <laughs> it would be fun, you know, because you could kind of really... Yeah, but I, then I realised that, like that corridor, obviously there would be an ethical problem about the corridor, say. So I, I just think the photos could be really interesting to treat them as objects within the analysis and um, perhaps go back, perhaps even put them in the middle of a piece of paper, you know, like with the student and actually have them sort of annotating and things like that, you know. And I don't know, I just, I really like that idea, you know, because it's a mysterious, isn't it, why they chose that thing. Uh, so anyway, I do think there are ethical problems, but I think it might be really fun. But I think if you anticipate the ethical issues, especially around anything to do with identification, and just only use and tell them only to bring things that are absolutely definitely not identifiable in any way, part of with obviously some some of the people that I've worked with do still bring photos that are technically identifiable, but they would never obviously use them within the dissemination or on sort of slides and stuff. Obviously, you know that I work at the University of Cumbria, which is why I've obviously got those sort of on there. But if I was trying to protect the, the institution that's taken part, obviously I would have to be really careful there. I do think, ethically speaking, 
Um, as long as you, your participant is giving consent to all of the different levels in which you would use that image, I think you can overcome some of those sort of issues in that way. And actually, it could, like you say, it could be a really important part of that analysis. It's just not one I've actually done, that's all. Some people in video with children, have you? I know you can do that fuzzy thing over their face and that, but I've seen a really clever thing in a lesson study book where they kind of made it more like a cartoon. It was, you know, like movie, the 300 soldiers blocking the pass, whatever it was. And they, they kind of made the movie look almost, it was real people they were filming, but then they made it into, that was really clever because it made it, again, it was quite attractive. You know, it was quite, but I suppose you could work with an illustrator and have them, they could draw that corridor, couldn't they? And then, and then you could, so you could have the sort of labels that the shoot, you could, you could just replace the actual photo with a kind of stylizing and that could resolve some of the ethical issues as well, because it could be any corridor really, in a way, it was the idea of the corridor, as you say, representing, but that bit of analysis that you made though, where you said, well, the corridor represented the staff. That was their picture of, instead of taking a team photo of the staff, I think that's a really important part of the analysis, and I think that that's the bit I could I could really see could get really rich. Um, yeah, there we are. Anyway, thank you, um, Liz. Uh, I'm hoping that people um, have enjoyed this afternoon. I really, really have, and several people have had to leave early and have um, sent on the conversation on the left there for thanks to you. But I'd just like like to say a huge thank you to you. Um, it's been really illuminating, both your presentation, the way you've answered the questions, and also the questions that have been asked have all been extremely interesting.